Hello again. I'm um, going to carry on this um, little series I thought about to talk about different animals. The um, first one I did, as I'm recording this, it was a few weeks ago, um, about elephants. That seemed to go down reasonably well. So um, I thought I'd talk about what was for a long time the only animal I was really photographing, and that's uh, humpback whales. And I guess I have a soft spot for them because I first started photographing them back in 1993. I did a project with Earth, Earthwatch at the time, and um, that was helping a couple of scientists with their research. They were um, basically camped on a small island in the Dampier Archipelago, which is in Western Australia. It's roughly halfway up the, the coast. And <clears throat> basically what they were doing was trying to find out where the Western population of Australian humpback whales um, basically carved and mated. So the way humpbacks work, because they're migratory whales, they basically do a loop. So in the summer, obviously in the southern summer in this case, they'll be down in Antarctica, and that's where they feed. And... One of the things about migratory whales rather than the ocean going whales, such as blue whale, so migratory whales such as the humpback, they tend to drive their own ecosystems. So, where they're eating, they're also defecating. So, they're producing food, <clears throat> excuse me, for um, smaller animals, so krill, those kind of things that they in turn eat. So, they're, they're kind of driving their own ecosystem. So, the more whales you have down there, the more is going into the ecosystem, which in turn feeds the whales. So I'll talk about their feeding habits in a moment. Um, what they then do as it gets cold, obviously it um, gets pretty cold down in Antarctica, the whales migrate north and that's where they mate and where they calve because if you think about it, calves don't have a lot of fat on them when they're born, so they need to be born into warmer waters. And... In um, on the east coast of Australia, that's sort of around southern Queensland or the sort of middle of Queensland, that area. But when I was with the whale researchers, uh, whale researchers, um, Kurt and Mitch, um, Jenna, they were trying to find out where those carving grounds were because it wasn't known at the time where they were, and that was important because there was a lot of um, exploration going on for the oil and gas industry at the time. And I remember um, one night when I was on the island because there was no power. We had a little generator on the island, but it was pretty much just us because without a permit, you weren't allowed to go on there um, because you weren't allowed to interfere with native animals. It was protected. So we had rock wallabies there, snakes, all the usual kind of stuff. And um, one night there was um, an oil rig <clears throat> parked basically that night um, on, on it was being towed out to where it needed to be to get oil or gas or whatever it was drilling for. So back in those days, Australia was leading the charge in terms of conservation. So there was an effort and an interest in finding out where these carving ground, grounds were so that they could be protected and the, um, the humpback whale population could continue to recover. So Humpback whales, on that note, they did get very close to extinction. And then in 1965, there was a moratorium to stop um, the hunting of whales. But to be honest, probably the drivers were more economical because what the whale blubber and the meat and all the other and the bone and all the rest of it had been traditionally used for had been replaced by other materials, other sources. So oil being one of them. Um, plastics, those kind of things. So there wasn't the same demand for whales that there had been. And to be honest about it, that was probably the main driver and the main reason a lot of these countries got behind the moratorium rather than doing it out of goodwill and a, a genuine care for the animals. So uh, unfortunately, it's the world we live in. So um, as I say, back in that time, so in 93, Kurt and Mitch, I think it was their second season in um, Enderby Island was the end of the island we were on. So lots of stories about that. And I've, I've covered that in another podcast. But that was really what they were trying to do. So that is what the whales do. So in the um, 
summer months, whether you're northern or um, southern hemisphere, and whales are found pretty much in every latitude. Uh, but obviously, if you're in the northern hemisphere, they're kind of six months out of sync with what's happening in the south. So I was, most of my, in fact, pretty much all of my photography has been down in the southern hemisphere. So um, for me, the the summer months were November, December, January, February, those kind of that part of the year. And that's when the uh, whales would be down in Antarctica. And then as it began to cool down there, they'd migrate north. And um, as I say, on the east, on the east coast, they'd be up in um, Queensland um, and that would be during the winter, so July, August, September, those sort of months. And um, on the west coast, they're going up, going up past uh, the Pilbara, which is where, which is a region in the western part of Australia, which is where we were located in uh, Enderby and Dampier. In fact, they went further north. They're actually up in the Kimberley, which is an amazing uh, part of Australia, not particularly developed, thankfully, and uh, absolutely stunning. So... That was where it all started for me, and I had an amazing time with Kurt and Mitch, and uh, learned a huge amount about conservation, about what we don't know about the whales, because I sort of glibly assumed that we pretty much knew all there was to know. And in fact, with a lot of animals, not just ocean-going animals, but particularly with animals in the ocean, we we really don't know very much at all. And it, it astonished me how little we did know. So not only were we trying to determine where these breeding grounds were. But we were also just observing behaviours and, you know, looking at what might be um, influencing the behaviours. I'm going to talk about those in a little bit as well. But it was very much a research trip and very much learning about um, the uh, what whales did and how they lived. And one of the things we did was to try and track individuals. So the way we did that, and it's all much more computerised now, it's much um, more developed than it was 30 years ago, uh, we would be taking photographs of the humpback. And the main thing we were trying to get was the underside of the tail. So that's known as the fluke. Because the markings on the tail and also the shape of the tail, um, there are minor differences, but they work like a fingerprint. So you can use that photograph. And we would also take photographs of the dorsal fin as a kind of secondary identification so ideally the set would be the underside of the um, tail fin the fluke and then a photograph of the left side of the uh, dorsal and then the right side of the dorsal fin so the little fin that's on the on the back so it is very small on the uh, the humpback but it does vary in shape quite a lot and um, that set of photographs plus the gps coordinates we had an early gps with us uh, GPS coordinates of where we'd seen the whale, the time and date when we'd seen the whale, that information all went back to um, a, a global database that was, um, I think is still in the US. And um, obviously it's quite painstaking to put all that data in and then start to correlate it, but you, but it was possible and it is possible to start tracking the movements of individual whales so we could see where they went. And that's where... Um, I'm going to talk in detail about the migration in a moment, but I'll just get on to um, what they what they eat. But that was the primary purpose of that particular project. So as I say, whales are uh, an animal that I've got a real soft spot for. Um, humpbacks are really gentle. I mean, they're huge, uh, but they are incredibly gentle, so they're not a risk. Occasionally, do, people are killed, but it's very rare, and it's generally an accident, and often people will just be in the wrong place at the wrong time. So... That's what I spent a lot of my photography years doing. So I, I think of myself as, um, I suppose, a, a, a photographer of large mammals. But it definitely started with humpbacks. So going back to the type of whale they are, they're what's known as a baleen whale. And they are the bigger whales. And then the other family of whales are the tooth whales. So tooth whales include things like the killer whale, dolphins, those sort of animals. So they they are smaller than the baleen whales, which include the blue whale, which is the the largest animal ever to have lived, as far as we know. And um, we know that 
the numbers of humpbacks are increasing. That's sort of reasonably measurable because the numbers that are spotted uh, during the annual annual migrations are counted at certain places um, around the world. So we know that those populations have recovered. It's much more difficult with the ocean-going whales um, like the blue whales because it's much harder to track where they go and um, to just count individuals because they are free-ranging individuals and they, they range for thousands of kilometres. Um, so anyway, so they're the two families. And baleen whales, rather than teeth, they have these um, sort of curtains of baleen which hangs from the the upper jaw, and it acts like a, a filter, like a strainer. Now, baleen is made of keratin, which is the same uh, substance that uh, makes up our hair and uh, our fingernails. And um, basically, whales will open their mouth, take in a huge um, amount of water, and then basically um, squeeze it out again through the keratin and any small animals that are in there. Um, they get trapped in the carotene and then they're swallowed. And um, baleen whales eat krill, um, so that's um, sort of small uh, crustaceans. They'll also eat small um, schooling fish, so things like anchovies, sardines, mackerel. And um, they tend to feed, though, when they're down in either the south with the southern whales in Antarctica or in the north around the in the Antarctic in Arctic waters in the north. They generally don't feed so much when they're migrating, and that includes when they're in the mating and calving grounds. So they are occasionally seen feeding, but it's more opportunistic feeding if they come across a um, a school of fish. So they'll they'll eat them. But if you ever see, if you if you're fortunate fortunate enough to see whales during the migration, you'll notice that in the early part of the migration, when they're on their way to the um, uh, birthing grounds, they they have quite a lot of blubber on them. When they come back again a few months later, you'll notice that they're much thinner. You can see the vertebrae in the back quite clearly in many whales. So they do lose a lot of uh, their body weight when they're doing the migration. And as I say, they don't eat usually until they're back down in the feeding ground. So they're quite distinct areas. And to give you an idea, um, a, a, an adult humpback will eat about 1.4 metric tons of food every day. So, um, you know, they, they require a lot of food when they're feeding. And one of the interesting things about whales, and you may have seen this, is that some groups, and it's definitely not all, but they do a thing called um, a bubble netting. And, and what they do, there's generally a little group of them, a little pod of them. And pod is essentially a group of whales, and it can be as small as one. <laughs> and it could be as big as maybe 10, that number. More likely, you're going to see two or three whales in a pod. That's the more common number or one, uh, because they're not particularly sociable animals, but they do um, kind of get together every now and again. And females will tend to have different partners. So they're not one of these mammals that mate for life or one of these animals that mate for life. They definitely move around a bit. Again, I shall come back to that. But one of the things they've been soon seen doing is this thing called bubble netting. And what they do, if there's a, a, a big school of fish, uh, they'll tend to swim underneath the fish, but just blowing bubbles out of their blowhole. And of course, as those bubbles go up, as the whale is swimming, it creates a curtain of air. So it tends to push the school of fish into a ball. So they become, because they're trying to stay away from the bubbles, so they'll kind of pull together. And then the whales will take it in turn to just come up through the middle with their mouth open and take in a huge amount of food. So it's quite an impressive thing to see. But what's really interesting is that not all whales do this. So it's it's a learned behaviour. It's not instinctive. So obviously a whale somewhere had the idea and started doing it. And then it graduate words sort of got around a little bit. Uh, we don't understand how that happened, how it originated and, and what goes on. But it, the, the observation, at least, that we can make is that this is a learned behaviour. So it's something that only certain whales do. <clears throat> Okay, so talking about the migration path, they have the longest migration of any mammal, and that can be up to 16,000 kilometres. I apologise for uh, listeners who think in miles, because I'm a bit of a 
metric person these days, so um, I'm going to be talking mostly in metric. And they can actually travel reasonably quickly. So a group was seen traveling from Alaska to Hawaii, which is 3,000 miles, (laughs) roughly, or about 4,800 kilometers. And they did that in 36 days. And whales can cover 200 kilometers in a day. Now, they're not necessarily going to do that, but that's, again, something that's been observed when they're, when they're in their migration. Now, in terms of um, speeds, their swimming speed, their top speed is around 25 to 30 kilometers per hour. That's 15 to 20 miles an hour. They'll tend to cruise at around 7 kilometers per hour. So that's more typically what you'll see. So when if you go whale watching and a whale is just swimming... That tends to be the sort of speed that they they go at. Um, Just anecdotally, um, what I've noticed is on the, for me, in the Southern Hemisphere, the Northern migration, when they're on their way to the mating and calving grounds, you'll often get whales that are just going. They, They don't want to stop. They're just swimming. And they don't really interact with the boat that much. Now, this is... Just something I've observed, and um, it may not be right. <laughs> it's simply an observation. But on the way back, when they're coming back further south, they seem more likely to interact. Now, that might not be other people's experience, but it's just it's just mine. So my, my view on that is that they're on a bit of a mission when they're going north, because, you know, sex and all the rest of it. But on the way back, it's like having a cigarette afterwards, and they're kind of cruisy. So um Behaviours can vary a little bit, but there are many other factors. Um, it depends on things like the weather, um, how many whales are about, if there are orcas about, if they got young, um, because uh, killer whales, the orcas, um, are the only predator they have. They'll tend to go after calves. What they do is drown it. And then qu- quite often, or paradoxically, they won't eat the whole animal, though. They tend to eat the jaw. Uh, so it's rather bizarre. And um, what they'll do is try and separate the calf from the mother, and then once the calf is, is separated, as I say, then drown it and um, eat the jaw. So generally, though, walkers won't go after the adults. It has been observed that a group will go after an adult humpback, but they're not always successful when that's happened. But as I say, that's quite rare. OK, so um, I've spoken about um, how they are socially. So they do they are a lot more kind of loose. They form loose bonds. So they tend to be individual or groups of twos or threes is more likely what you're going to see. Um, I've mentioned that females have a variety of partners. And one of the things you will see, and the females tend to be a bit larger than the males, the males will often fight to win the right to mate with a female. Now, it's not sort of brutal fighting, but you'll often see scratches and uh, marks on a whale, which some of it will be from fighting with other whales. It can, it can be from other things too. Um, so there's definitely, um, they have to prove themselves before they can mate. And in, in whale watching circles, at least in Sydney, where I did most of my whale watching, that would be referred to as a competition pod. And you would often see three animals together. So one female and two males. And there'd be a lot of activity among the males. Um, trying to put one another off or whatever they're doing. And obviously a lot of that is happening out of sight because it's happening underwater, but it was um, an observation and we we would refer to them as competition pods. Talking about all of that, um, to talking about reproduction, which obviously has an impact on how quickly numbers can recover, the gestation for um, humpback is around 11 and a half months and Uh, females will typically have a calf every two to three years. So it's obviously quite a long um, gestation period. Now, the calves, when they're born, can be anything from three to four and a half metres long, and they can weigh up to a tonne. So (laughs) that's a pretty big baby. And to give you an idea, that's similar to an elephant. Um, It's slightly smaller than an elephant, but it gives you some idea of what you're talking about when one of these is is born. And there has been film of them being born, so they're live birth, like we are, and um, that's quite amazing to watch. So an adult will grow up to, so fully grown humpback can grow anything up to about 19 metres, that's around 60 feet. They can weigh 
up to about 40 tons. That's 80,000 pounds. So obviously they're pretty big animals. It's not really known how long they live for. Um, as we, I guess as time goes on and we've got the information, we're able to, we're getting better at tracking individual whales. We'll get much clearer insight into how long they're likely to live. But that obviously takes time. And the guess at the moment is in the wild, it can be anything from 50 to 80 years. So to be absolutely sure about that, it's going to take another few decades of research. So um, I probably won't be around when that happens. But um, that's kind of the the understanding, the guess, for want of a better word at the moment. Um, now, the kind of behaviours you're likely to um, see... Breaching is obviously the most spectacular, and that's when they jump out of the water, and they they sometimes jump completely out of the water. Um, other times they kind of come half out, or they'll come almost all of the way out and just have the fluke, the tail in the water. But you'll get these um, these breaches sometimes when it's just the head comes out, and then they splash it into the water. We refer to that as a head lunge, so it's not regarded as a breach because it's only the the top part of the body, the the head that comes out. Um, But you also get other things. So you get tail throws, which is um, where they splash their tail. So they lift the back of their body, the the, the sort of end of the body and then the tail, and they splash it hard against the water. Now, we think that's to basically tell whatever's around to go away. Uh, It might be a whale watching boat. And I've certainly seen this with a mother with a calf. And it's decided we've got too close. And this, I, I, actually, I remember this happening once. We were heading out of Sydney Head. So we just left Sydney Harbour and going out into the ocean when suddenly this whale um, did a tail throw right in front of us. We hadn't even seen it and it had a calf. But we hadn't seen a blow. Normally you can see them as you're approaching them. And um, you see the blow where they, they breathe out when they reach the surface. So that's like a puff of steam. That's what it looks like. So normally that's... Um, that's often the first sign that you have that a whale is there. You see the blow. But on that occasion, we hadn't. And the mother gave us a clear warning that she didn't want us any closer. At least that's how we interpreted what we were seeing. So the tail's pretty impressive. It can be up to five and a half metres. That's around 18 feet across. And as I've said, the pattern and the markings and even the the shape, because it's got these kind of little ripples along the the back edge of it and they can vary in shape and size and some of them are bitten off and all sorts of things happen and then they also have marks from scrapes from where there's barnacles have attached themselves and then dropped off that leaves a little circular mark so there's all these marks come together and it, it's a very effective way of identifying an individual whale so the tail is quite important from that perspective now another thing that you'll often see is uh, pectoral slapping. So that's the pectoral fin. So that's the one on the side of the body. And um, often they'll lie on their back and just splash their, have their fin, pectoral fin out of the water and just splash them. The um, pectoral fins, they're the largest appendage on any mammal. They can be up to about five metres long. So they're around slightly more than a quarter of the whale's body length so they're very large and in fact that's partly where the latin name uh, which is megeptera megoptera (laughs) terrible latin but it basically means big winged and that's um, referring to these pectoral fins if you look at a picture of a humpback it has very large pectoral fins and the other thing that you'll notice about them is they have a very small dorsal fin on the back it's about two-thirds Um, along the length of the body and there's a little hump in front of the pectoral fin which is one of the reasons they got the name hump back Um, and another reason that I understood anyway was that when they dive they arch their back so there's a very clear arching of the back when they dive deep so if you think of it if you were swimming on the water and you want to dive deep you'll tend to push your head down and lift your legs up and then you'll go you know more or less straight down and humpbacks swim in the same way they um, evolved from a land animal so in their skeleton they still have residual bones from what were their legs but they don't do anything now but the um, pectoral fins are pretty much their hands so the, the 
finger bones um, have become elongated and they form uh, much of the pectoral fins. So um, humpbacks did evolve from um, a land animal. I think they're, no, I didn't look this up, but I'm pretty sure they're related to hippos and animals like that. So they're going back a few million years, there was a common ancestor on the land and then, um, you know, that that animal split. Some of them went back into the ocean and developed into the whales and um, others stayed on land. Okay, so um, just talking about communication. So you may have heard of whale song. You might have even heard whale song. Originally, it was thought that just the males sang, but it's now known that females sing as well, although the songs are different. So whales, uh, male whales, and they're known as bulls, will tend to sing for longer. Their songs can last anything from 5 to 30 minutes. The female, and they're known as cows, uh, their songs are much shorter. And the songs, so we're not sure what they mean for one thing. It could be to do with mating. They're often heard during the the mating season. Uh, It could be another way of communicating something they also make other noises like grunts, groans, snorts. So the, the song is punctuated with um, with those noises. And what's also been discovered is that um, calves can also communicate and they'll tend to make a whisper to their mothers. And that tends to be um, just lower tones and, and fairly short range. Uh, whale songs from adults can go anywhere up to 20 to 30 K. So underwater sound travels a long way. Unfortunately, with our activities, and you you don't really understand this until you've listened on a hydrophone, we make a huge amount of noise. So ships, um, things like cargo ships, cruise ships, whatever, even the smaller boats that you get around places like Sydney, they're very noisy underwater. So noise travels a long way and it's very clear. And I remember when I was with the guys on Enderby, we had a hydrophone and Kurt had put it over the side to listen. He let me have a listen. And I could clearly hear propeller noise, but I couldn't see anything. And then I looked around and right on the horizon, there was a container ship. And it just blew me away how much noise we make. So for the whales, I mean, individuals won't notice it, I guess, because they've grown up with it. But they've transitioned from what must have been a very, very silent place to live when we were engaged in sailing ships and things like that into somewhere that's like a disco, 24-hour disco going on. So um, j- just interesting, and it's it's definitely something we've had an impact on, and, and who knows what effect that is having on the whales, either physically, maybe maybe there are evolutionary changes going on, maybe with their hearing to, to cope with that, and maybe socially there are things going on in behaviour, who knows? But we definitely have an impact with the, uh, uh, the noise. Okay, um... So one other thing that you might notice when you look at a whale is on the head, there are these large lumps. They're called tubercles. And each has at least one stiff hair growing out of it. So it's probably not the most attractive feature because they're, you know, in some respects, quite ugly looking. (laughs) If you like sleek things, I like the look of the blue whales. I love humpbacks, but I think the blue whale aesthetically definitely does it for me. And, um, it's thought, again, as I've said before, we don't know very much. So we haven't made educated guesses on a lot of this. But it's thought that the hairs might be detecting motion nearby. So, um, again, we're not, not sure what they're used for. Uh, one thing that is interesting, and I have seen this occasionally, is that whales and dolphins will swim together. So, um, again, we don't know the interaction. We don't know why they do it. We don't know if the dolphins are just having fun. Uh, but... You know, it seems to be quite amicable, is all, all, we, all we can say. Okay, um, in terms of predators, I've mentioned the orcas. They are the only predators in terms of where we sit with them. They're harmless to us. And as I've said, luckily, or for, you know, fortunately, we've seen an increase in the whale numbers. And um, I know in Sydney, we expect the whale numbers to increase by about 10% every year and the number now I'm a little out of date so I probably got this wrong but the number around Sydney is around I think it's 30,000 now or was last time I checked so it might have even moved from now uh, from there 
but that's a lot of whales. Now, they tend to come through in waves, so you don't get, you know, a steady trickle, but you'll get kind of pulses of whales, if you like. So you'll get little groups of twos and threes, and then there'll be another group of two or three a little further away, and then another group somewhere else. And then nothing for a while, and then ones and twos and threes, you know, going through. So whale watching, like looking at any wild animal, is um, always, there's always an element of luck to it with your timing. But uh, if you go at the peak times, so in Sydney, the best times to go, uh, whales tend to start going past Sydney around the middle of May and um, heading north, and they'll keep going until July, July, August. And then the return trip starts sort of September through to around the end of November. There are always exceptions. Some whales are early. You get individuals that go north early, individuals that go south early. At the end of the season, the, the last whales to tend, that tend to go by are the females that carved quite late, so they'll often be on their own with a calf. They tend to swim quite close to the shore because they're less vulnerable to orcas uh, if they come in close. So um, that's another thing that you'll see. Um, another thing that impacts where they go are the currents. So where there's a fast current, the whales will tend to sit in it if it's going in their direction because obviously that allows them to travel uh, much further for less effort. Now, if you are interested in whale watching uh definitely have a look at whatever's near you but just bear in mind they are migratory animals so you're not going to see them all year round a lot of the whale watching groups do updates on the whales they've seen so jarvis bay in um new south wales so that's about three hours roughly three hours south of sydney um i was looking at them do it they do an update on what they've seen in terms of humpbacks uh, seals, dolphins, other whales. They've had minke whales as well. I was looking this morning. And um, there are lots of the, the whale-watching organisations now do that. They have apps or they'll post on Instagram. So um, check those out just to see what's going on. If you haven't been and you'd like to see whales, they are amazing. And um, to have an animal as big as that swimming along your, alongside your boat is really amazing to have one breach right next to you is brilliant when i was in um enderby with the researchers we'd been tracking a whale a single whale and we'd lost him him or her they'd gone down and they can stay down for quite a long time when they're swimming they'll tend to come up every three minutes that's the normal kind of downtime so downtime is just the time they spend below the surface but that would be typically three minutes but they can stay much much longer and if they're not happy with uh, the whale watching boat, if you're in a whale watching boat and they're not happy, they they quite often go down for lower. They'll often change direction, uh, so might swim under the boat, go the other way, go out to sea, do all of these other things. So um, it's there's a lot of variables when you're looking at whales in Sydney. You're also restricted to how close you can go, so that's 100 meters, and I think it's 150 meters if there's a calf. However, there's nothing to stop the whales coming up to you. So often we would stop and just idle the engines and wait if the, if the whales were swimming around. And often they would then come up to us. Uh, the other thing, the, the other limitation in Sydney is that the number of boats around the whale is supposed to be limited to, I think it's three, maximum four. So if there's already boats around the pod, you're supposed to hold back until one disappears off. So... As always with these things, not everybody um, respects those rules, but they're there to protect the animals, stop them getting stressed. Uh, as, as I've said, it's quite a noisy environment they're in, and who knows what it's like for them. They might enjoy it, but um, you know, our concern as people looking at whales and caring about whales is to make sure they're not stressed in any way. So um, that's another regulation. And for those of you who are thinking about uh, drones, um, as far as I'm aware, now it's certainly true, it was true in Sydney, you're not allowed to fly drones around them. Dr there is drone footage around, and I, I, that you can certainly get an exemption if you're doing scientific research. And um, three, four years ago, there was, um, I, don't, I, I assume they're still doing it, but in, um, I think it was Sydney, it might have been California, they had um, a drone called the Snotbot, <laughs> 
And um, what that was doing, so it was a drone, but it had a little um, kind of catchment thing on it. And as a whale was coming up to surface, because when you're over the water, you can see the whale much more clearly coming up, particularly if they've got white on their body. It looks like a light green, but that makes them really easy to see. But as as it was coming up to the surface, they would fly the drone so that when the whale surfaced and blew out um, the plume, uh, the, the drone could fly through it and capture um the um you know whatever was in the blow it, it, it's a bit like us blowing our nose so there's all sorts of stuff in there bacteria and heaven knows what so um if you're on a whale watching boat and you have a whale near you and it blows don't breathe in the blow <laughs> that's my tip so i've got some film i shot of uh one encounter where the whale did swim run up to our boat and it blew and i kind of swung the camera around really for two reasons first is i didn't want to breathe any of it in and secondly i didn't want it on my camera lens or on my camera or on me frankly so um yeah some people have silly ideas that it's healthy or it's it's like you know walking into a sneeze it's not the smartest thing to do okay so that really i think is everything i was planning to say about whales it's certainly all i can remember at the moment and um, it's probably long enough (laughs) from uh, your perspective but I hope you found that interesting um as I say if you, if you haven't been to see whales in the ocean and you get the opportunity I, I absolutely recommend it. it it just blows everyone away and um, I mean I've had, I've been in a small rib when a whale br- I was going to tell the story um I think I diverted myself but yeah th- this whale that had gone down that was where I diverted sorry I'll finish my story um this male had, had disappeared and we'd stopped we just turn the engine off and we're floating because and having some lunch and all of a sudden this whale breached right next to us um i think one of the guys just thrown some scraps overboard or something um fruit or something anyway um this whale breached right next to us and it was probably at least three times the length of our boat so (laughs) that was that was pretty impressive but they they are amazing animals and um uh as i've said Definitely recommend it if you get the chance to go. Okay, I'm going to stop waffling on and um, I'll I'd say I hope you've enjoyed that and I'll speak to you again in the next podcast. Bye for now. I hope you enjoyed that podcast. Now, if you did and um, you're interested in wildlife photography or really a basic introduction to photography, I suppose, my next free webinar is taking place on Wednesday, the 31st of January. That's at 7 p.m. Central European time, so Paris time. And um, it doesn't really matter if you can't make the live event because everybody who registers, so once you register, I get your email address. Uh, Once the webinar has finished, normally one or two hours later, um, you will get uh, um, an email from me with a link to the recording. So uh, if you're not able to make the live event, if you're in Australia or somewhere else, that shouldn't be a problem. So that's on uh, Wednesday, the 31st of January. And there's a link in the description. It's on Eventbrite and um, you can also find it on my website. So if you go to the website, you'll find the link there. Uh, And www.ge.photography should take you there. Okay, speak to you soon. Bye now.